Want to master grammar so you can speak properly, express yourself better, and understand more? In this video, I'll show you how to master grammar with our lessons and learning program. Let's begin. Number one, listen to the lesson conversations and explanations. In every lesson, you learn a conversation. Then, our teachers break down every word and grammar rule. So you're actually learning grammar rules in the context of conversations, and you can easily see how they're used. Once you're done, review the conversation again and again to remember what you've learned. Number two, read the bonus explanations and tutorials. With the lesson notes, you get extra grammar explanations and examples that are not presented in the lesson. After you're done with the lesson, read the lesson notes for extra review. You can even save them as PDFs so that you can access them anytime. Number three, leave a comment on the lesson. Once you've learned a grammar point, be sure to use it. Leave a comment in the comment section. Write some example sentences for practice. Our teachers will review your comment and give you feedback. Number four, unlock even more grammar lessons. If you want to find all of the grammar lessons available, visit our lesson library. Under category, choose grammar. You'll get all of the pathways and lessons dedicated to helping you learn and master sentence patterns and grammar points. So, if you're ready to finally learn a new language the fast, fun, and easy way, sign up for your free lifetime account by clicking on the link in the description. Signing up takes less than 30 seconds, and you'll start speaking from your very first lesson. If you enjoyed these tips, hit the like button, share it with anyone who's trying to learn a new language, and subscribe to our channel. We release new videos every week. I'll see you next time. Bye! Hi everybody, welcome back to Ask Alicia, the weekly series where you ask me questions and I answer them. Maybe. First question comes from Isaac Alexander. Hi again, Isaac. Isaac says, hi Alicia, what's the difference between by chance, by accident, and accidentally? By chance tends to be used in more positive situations. You can think of it as like a happy accident. When you have a happy accident, you can use by chance. I was out shopping and I ran into a coworker by chance. By accident is probably the least used of these three that you've introduced. So by accident, you might also hear on accident. We use this for negative coincidences, things that are not so good. I sent my boss the wrong files on accident. The last one that you introduced accidentally is the most common one that we use for negative situations, negative coincidences. I accidentally deleted my portfolio. And with this pronunciation, I'm saying it really clearly, accidentally, accidentally. But in fast speech, we say accidentally, accidentally. I accidentally deleted my portfolio. So I hope that that helps you. Thanks very much for the question. Let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Jahanvi. Hi, Jahanvi. Jahanvi says, what is the difference between in spite and despite? The two have the same meaning. In spite and despite just have to be kind of slightly changed to fit into a sentence. Let's look at two examples. In spite of her sensitive stomach, my friend ate ice cream every day. Despite her sensitive stomach, my friend ate ice cream every day. So when we make a sentence with in spite, we say in spite of a noun phrase. When we use despite, we say despite followed by a noun phrase. I want to connect this question to a similar question that we got for this week. This is from uh, Moad Giton. Hi, Moad. Um, Moad said, I want to ask about the differences between despite, although, though, and in spite of. So we talked about despite and in spite of. We tend to use although a little more often at the beginning of a sentence, like although, it's kind of like a formal but, and though might be more like at the middle part of a sentence. So like A, though, B. So that's kind of how we might use these two. I hope that that answers uh, both of your questions. I hope that that helps you. I'll try to make a whiteboard video about this topic as well. Thanks very much for sending these questions. Okay, let's move along to your next question. Next question comes from Satish. Hi, Satish. Satish says, hi, Alicia, how are you? I'm good. Uh, when I listen English, I am translating it to my country's language in my mind. How can I stop that? And was using present continuous tense in the above sentence correct? 
Um, so one, your present continuous tense, no, it is not correct in that. I'll come back to that a little bit later. For now though, your question about translating um, to your language in your head. I've talked about this a couple times here and there in other videos, um, so I'll just review again by sharing the things that helped me to stop translating in my head. One thing that really helped me was making an environment, making a place where I could not escape into my native language. So in my case, that meant I found like a hobby group, something that I wanted to learn how to do. I found that in my target language. I found that in Japanese. I would go to that once a week. There was no option for me to do that in English. The teacher didn't speak English. The other students didn't really speak English. Like I had no choice but to learn and it was hard at first. So over time I learned the vocabulary words. Um, I met people and I got to chat a little bit with people. Um, and then I also just kind of like built my listening skills as well. So that was really helpful for me. Following that then, I would often like go out with people from that group. So I would make friends there and then maybe we'd go out for drinks or we'd go to get something to eat together. And that was another situation where I could not escape into English. So I had to use Japanese. I had no choice. If I didn't do that, I couldn't talk to anybody. So that was really helpful for me. Um, and this leads to my second tip for stopping this sort of translation problem, um, which is Try not to rely on your dictionary. Like I know that we all now have a phone and like there's a dictionary in here we can check when we don't know a word. But my problem with this, with using this too much, is that it stops the flow of conversation. Like when you're talking with someone and you don't know exactly the word you wanna use, instead of just reaching for your dictionary, try to think of a different way to explain the thing that you're trying to say. You wanna say, turn on the light. Like you can't think of turn on. So what are some other ways that you could explain that motion? Like, uh, how do I say like the light is not bright and then the light becomes bright. What's this, what's this action? Like think of the tools that you have in your head to explain the idea and then your friend can teach you the word. So use that as an opportunity to one, use the words that you already know and then so two, get a new word using those tools. Um, three, it's just a really great communication tool because even sometimes like in our native language we forget a word or we don't know the right word to use. So just think about using the tools that you already have. The other thing that I would recommend and that I've recommended a lot on this channel is consuming media. So that means TV and movies, books, comics, whatever. Trying to use the language as much as possible in your day-to-day -day life, like listening to it and reading it. Um, because you're kind of absorbing the natural ways that people use that language. Like textbook language and real world language are different. So you need to make sure you have a chance to experience that real world language. So media is great. Of course, you can check out the stuff we have on our channel and our website, but you can just watch movies, um, watch TV shows, find podcasts as well. So there are lots of different ways to check out media. But basically just try to get your brain used to um, listening to and experiencing the language so that you don't have to like really work at translating every single sentence in your head. And then over time and with practice, you will eventually stop translating and one day you'll just be able to do it and you probably won't realize it. That's what happened to me actually. Like I just one day I was like, oh, I don't have to translate anymore. It just was the, it just was done. So I hope that that helps you. Those are a few tips for translating in your head. Your other question was about your use of present continuous tense in your first sentence. You said, when I listen to English, I am translating it to my country's language. We would not use the present continuous tense here because you're talking about a regular action that you do. This is a regular thing that you do. We use the present continuous tense for temporary actions. So in this case, you should say, I translate it in my head. Use the present tense there. Okay, so thanks very much for those questions. I hope that it helps you. Let's move on to our next question. Next question comes from Eric. Hi, Eric. Eric says, uh, hi, what does get wild mean? In this phrase, for example, he's getting wild with the letters. Uh, to get wild means to be crazy, like to go crazy, to do something like surprising or shocking. I'm not sure exactly about your example sentence situation, to get wild with the letters. I'm not sure what that is but it's like, it means to become crazy, to do something crazily. Maybe graffiti? Graffiti? Ah, to get wild with the letters, like drawing the letters, right. could be. Maybe he has like a stack of letters in his room and he's just throwing them all over the place. 
I don't know. Like, if I could get wild with the lesson and just start running around the studio, he would be like, she's getting wild with the lesson. Tear down the green screen. Ah, to get wild with the lesson. <laughs> and we're done. So I hope that that helps you understand the expression, get wild. Thanks very much for the question. Let's move along to your next question. Next question comes from Joey. Joey, hi Joey. Joey says, what's the difference between envy and jealous? Um, envy is a noun and a verb. So for example, I envy you or envy is dangerous. Jealous is an adjective. Like, you got the best seats in the theater. I'm so jealous. You got a long vacation. I'm super jealous. All right, so I hope that that helps you. Thanks for the question. All right, that's everything that I have for this week. Thank you, as always, for sending your questions. Remember, you can send them to me at englishclass101.com slash ask hyphen Alicia. Of course, if you like the video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to our channel if you have not already, and check us out at englishclass101.com for some other things that can help you with your English studies. Thanks very much for watching this week's episode of Ask Alicia, and I will see you again next week. Bye-bye. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Ask Alicia, the weekly series where you ask me questions and I answer them. Maybe. First question this week comes from Naru. Hi again, Naru. Naru says, hi, Alicia. What's the difference between it and that? For example, I do yoga every morning. I do it, too. Or I do that, too. We use it to replace a noun that we mentioned earlier in the conversation. Um, so like, for example, I bought a new computer. It's really cool. Or I built a new computer. It was really hard. So that it refers to like the process of building a computer or it refers to like the computer I bought um, in the first sentence. So we use it to replace that thing, that object, that specific process. When we use that, however, yes, we are talking about something we referred to earlier in the conversation, but we're using it for something that the speaker and the listener shared. It's a shared experience. So if you use that to talk about an experience that you did not share with your listener, it's gonna sound really weird. So in your example, like I do yoga every morning and someone says, oh, I do that too. It makes sense because both speakers in that situation have the experience of doing yoga in the morning. If you say, oh, I do it too, it's like, it's not wrong, but it does sound less natural than using that. So when you have a shared experience of a situation, you can use that. I hope that this helps you. Thanks for an interesting question. Okay, let's get on to your next question. Next question comes from Artie. Hi, Artie. Artie says, hi, Alicia. How do you politely ask someone about their health condition? Is it common to use, are you sick? Since sick can also mean crazy or insane. Uh, yeah, good question. And actually, it's totally fine to ask, are you sick? That's totally fine. This depends on your intonation. So if you say, are you sick? And you have this like concerned look and you have this concerned voice, there's not gonna be a communication problem. If you've seen a movie where a character is like, are you sick? <laughs> like that's a situation where it's talking about the person's like mental health. They're like, are you crazy? Are you insane? When they use like that shocked, horrified face, like, are you sick? Do you want to fill all those donuts with mustard? That's a situation where you would say, are you sick? And it means crazy or insane. Other ways you could ask would be like, are you okay? Are you feeling okay? Do you have a cold? That kind of thing. Thanks very much for the question. Let's go to your next question. Next question comes from Ismail. Hi, Ismail. Ismail says, hi, Alicia. Thanks for your support. What's the difference between may and might? There isn't really a difference, honestly. Uh, may and might are used in the same situations when you're talking about possibility. In American English, however, might is more common than may. Some examples. I might have forgotten my wallet. I may have forgotten my wallet. They're the same. But may sounds a bit more formal in American English. We tend to use might. So this question actually connects nicely with a question from another viewer. Uh, this comes from Alan Chan. Hi, Alan. Alan asked, hi, Alicia. How can I use may be, might, and probably? OK, so we talked about how we use may and might in the same way to talk about possibility. So now let's talk about may and be together. Not maybe, but may 
be, and might and probably. So let's compare these. We use may and be when we want to talk about something that could possibly be something else. That sounds very open. So let's look at some examples. Hmm, this may be the restaurant he recommended. He may be the right person for the job. So this is the pattern we can use for may be and might be. So I want to continue on to probably. So if we imagine may and might express this sort of like uncertainty, maybe on a scale from like zero to 100, may and might is maybe like 40% or so probably has a much higher level of certainty, like 70% or 80% or so. So we have a pretty good idea of what's going to happen in the future, but there's a little bit of like wiggle room, like we're still not 100% sure. Some examples. I'm probably gonna sleep late tomorrow. She's probably not gonna reply tonight. So it probably shows the speaker has a higher level of certainty. So I hope that this helps you use may and might and maybe and might be and probably and maybe also too. Thanks very much for these two questions. Great. Let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Lombardozzi. Marco, hi Lombardozzi. Lombardozzi <laughs> says, can you explain the difference between all and whole with some examples? Sure. Let's begin by looking at some example sentences. My dog ate all the cupcakes. My dog ate the whole cake. My roommate stole all the iPhone chargers. My roommate stole my whole electronics box. You can see in the sentences that use all that we're looking at individual units of something. In the first example sentence with the dog, the dog ate all the cakes, all the cupcakes. So we're talking about individual units there. In the second situation, the roommate stole all the iPhone chargers. So we're looking at individual units, one thing, but all of those one things. So when we want to emphasize the unit, we use all, all plus the unit. You'll also notice that the units use the plural form. We're using the plural form of the noun. So in the dog situation, it's cupcakes. In the roommate situation, it's iPhone chargers. We're using the plural form. However, when we're using whole, we're talking about something that can be broken down into units. So in the dog situation, it's a cake. So one cake can be like many smaller pieces of cake. In the second example sentence, uh, it's about like a box of electronic equipment or like electronic related things. So it's not the things inside the box, it's the complete box. So we imagine that this is like one complete unit, one complete set of something. So we use all, like I said, when we want to emphasize like the units, the small pieces of something. So like all my cupcakes or all of my iPhone chargers, we're emphasizing the unit there using whole to like refer to a larger thing that's composed of many smaller units really emphasizes like your level of shock or your level of surprise that that thing was affected. So as you pay attention in your reading, I think reading will help you to find some more examples of this. Just look and see like the kinds of units and the typical kinds of like um, larger nouns that get this whole treatment. So like foods are great examples, like a whole pizza or a whole cake or a whole turkey or a whole chicken. So that refers to one thing composed of many parts. So I hope that this helps you. Thanks very much for the question. Let's go on to your next question. Your next question is from Tian Fu. Hi, Tian. Uh, Tian says, can you explain a bit more sophisticated? Without context, I can't be exactly sure what this means, um, but I think that this is a comparative phrase. So let's make a complete sentence to start. Restaurant A is a bit more sophisticated than restaurant B. So a bit more means like a little more than something else, a little more, or a small amount more than something else. Sophisticated means like refined, or maybe they have lots of um, culture, lots of knowledge, if you're talking about a person. In this case, with a restaurant, maybe it's well-rounded. So um, there's like lots of kind of experience that was used to make this restaurant. Like the restaurant decorator had lots of worldly experience, or the menu has a lot of like different world flavors. I don't know. So it's something that's sophisticated sophisticated, it has like a high class image. So if you use a bit more sophisticated, it means item A is a higher level of sophistication 
than item B, in this case, a restaurant. So I hope that this helps with your understanding of the phrase a bit more sophisticated. Okay, that's everything that I have for this week. Thank you, as always, for sending your questions. Remember, you can send them to me at englishclass101.com slash ask hyphen Alicia. Of course, if you like the video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel if you haven't already, and check us out at englishclass101.com for some other things that can help you with your English studies. Thanks very much for watching this week's episode of Ask Alicia, and I will see you again next week. Bye-bye. So which is better, Pokemon or Spider-Man? Pokemon. Uh, Pokemon. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Ask Alicia, the weekly series where you ask me questions and I answer them. Maybe. First question this week comes from Karima again. Hi, Karima. Karima says, Hi, Alicia. Could you please tell me what does the expression give it a try mean? Give it a try is a friendly way to suggest someone try something. So we use give it a try like after we show someone a process we teach someone how to do something we show them how to do something and then we say okay give it a try like now it's your turn please try this thing i showed you like if you're at the golf course and you show someone how to swing a golf club you could say all right give it a try. I think we do it on this channel, actually. We introduce like a vocabulary point or a grammar point and then ask you, give it a try. So it's a suggestion to try something. Hope that helps you. Thanks for the question. Okay, next question. Next question comes from Sanju. Hi, Sanju. Sanju says, what is the main difference between simple past and present and past participle or perfect tense? The main difference is that simple past tense is used for actions that started and finished in the past. There's often a specific time point. We know when the action started and when the action finished. With perfect tense though, we don't know when the action started or when the action finished. So we use it to talk about like life experience in the past, like maybe when it happened is not so important, but we use it for like travel experience or job experience. So that's one thing that we do with perfect tense. The other thing is we use it to talk about actions that started in the past and that continue to the present, especially with the continuous tense. We also do this um, to talk about the effects of actions that started in the past and continue to the present. So like, for example, I saw Beyonce live last week is a past tense sentence. So when we want to use the perfect tense, like we've seen Beyonce live so many times, that means we've seen Beyonce in the past many times, but when is not important. So we use that perfect tense, we've seen, we have seen. So another example, like when I get this question, I sometimes will say like, I've talked about this many times. I have talked about this many times is a perfect tense statement. So in the past, I have discussed this. this is something I talked about uh, at points in the past. So I can use perfect tense to describe that. So if you have any questions about simple past tense or present perfect tense, I would recommend checking the videos that we have on the website or on the YouTube channel. So I talk more about how to use these two grammar points. Thanks for the question. I hope that that helps. Okay, next question. Next question comes from Semi. Hi again, Semi. Semi says, hi, what's the difference uh, I want you to know, I want to you know, I want you know. From these choices, only the first one is grammatically correct. I want you to know. So it could introduce something. It could introduce an idea, like I want you to know I did my best. The other two things that uh, you presented here, they're not grammatically correct. Maybe with some punctuation or maybe in a conversation with the right emphasis, they could be part of something else, I'm not sure. But the other two things uh, are not grammatically correct. So the difference here is that your first option is correct and it can begin an idea. I hope that that helps you. Okay, let's move on to your next question. Next question question comes from Danny. Hi, Danny. Hi again, Danny. Danny says, I'd like to know about finish, has finished, and is finished. Okay. Um, finish can be a noun or a verb, as in the first item, just finish. In present tense, it's used like in present situations or to talk about future situations. So like, let's finish work or we should finish this soon so we can go to the party, <laughs> something like that. Let's finish, so that's an upcoming activity. Let's go on to is finished. 
When we see this is finished, it's actually finished being used as an adjective. So we know that because we see is there. Is is our verb. So like he is finished, she is finished, class is finished. So it's an adjective. It's describing the situation. Finished there, we use that to talk about something that is completed. It's done. So we could use a verb form like class finished at nine o'clock, or we could say like at nine o'clock, class is finished. So that's the current state. That's the current situation. Uh, the race is finished or dinner is finished. Let's compare that to has finished. So has finished is using the present perfect form. So finished here is the past participle form of the verb finished. Something has finished. As I talked about in one of the other questions in today's episode, um, has finished, that would be the present perfect tense, mean that something occurred in the past and the effects of that continue to the present. This is an example of an effect continuing to the present. We would see has finished used in like a polite situation, for example. Like I imagine at like a hotel breakfast service. If hotel breakfast ends at like nine o'clock, but I'm a guest and I arrive at 9.30 and I wanna eat breakfast, the hotel staff might say to me, sorry, breakfast has finished. So they could say, I'm sorry, breakfast is finished. That's kind of direct sounding. But if they say breakfast has finished, we could think of it like, the like ending point for breakfast was at nine o'clock, but there's this effect. And the effect of that is that me, the guest, like I can't eat breakfast now because it finished in the past. So we could kind of think of it like an effect. So I hope that that helps you. Thanks very much for the question. Okay, let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Sridhar Reddy. Hi again, Sridhar. Sridhar says, hi Alicia, which one is correct in the following sentences? One, not all questions can't be answered by Alicia. Or two, not all questions can be answered by Alicia. The first sentence I read on your site, why use both not all and can't be? I thought using only one of them makes a sentence meaningful. Yes, thank you very much. You found what is called a typo. A typo is a typing mistake. So I checked this out on the website. We will fix it. You are correct. This should be can. Uh, so not all questions can be answered by Alicia. That would be the correct sentence. It should not be can't, so we'll fix that. If you see a pattern like this, not all somethings can be something. So that would be the correct way to build this kind of sentence structure. Okay, I hope that helps and thank you very much for this point. Uh, next question comes from Antonio Laco. Hi, Antonio. Antonio says, I am confused about when to use I talk with blah, blah, blah versus I talk to blah, blah, blah. Can you help with that? By the way, you're very funny. Thanks. I talk to or I talk with. Yes, I've spoken about this very, very briefly in I think the video about speak versus talk. Basically, there's not really a difference between to and with here. When we use to though, I feel that it has more of a one-way conversational feeling. Like if you're giving someone information, if it's kind of just one person sharing a lot of information talking, I might use to like go talk to your boss about this or like let's talk to my parents about this when you use with however it sounds more like you're participating in something together you're participating in a discussion together like you do things with another person so there's someone else there participating together with you. So using with to me sounds a little bit more like there are other people participating, other people involved. Like I said, it's a really small point. Both of them are correct. You won't have any communication problems if you choose to or with or if you choose to mix them. Hope that helps you. All right, that's everything that I have for you for this week. Thank you as always for sending your questions. Remember, you can send them to me at englishclass101.com slash ask hyphen Alicia. Of course, if you like the video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to our channel if you have not already and check us out at englishclass101.com for a few other things that can help you with your English studies. Thanks very much for watching this week's episode of Ask Alicia and I will see you again next week. Bye bye. Hair police, hair police. Eric is the chief of the hair police. <laughs> oh my god. That's recorded. Okay. Um, Beyonce. Hi everybody. Welcome back to Ask Alicia, the weekly series where you ask me questions and I answer them.
Maybe. Your first question comes from Maison. Hi, Maison. Maison says, hi, Alicia. What's the difference between picture, image, and photo? In most cases, we use them the same. When you use a camera, uh, you can say photo or picture. Take a picture or take a photo. We use them the same way. So image can refer, yes, to a picture or to a photo, though it does sound more like something maybe printed or published. Generally speaking, image is used to refer to a depiction or a representation of something else. So that means it could be like a painting. So this is an image of a goddess, or this is an image of a person on a boat, for example. So image is a depiction, a representation of something. So that means it can be physical, and it can also be in your mind, like a mental picture of something. We could also call that an image. We have an image of something in our heads. So like, my image of her is ruined, or I have a really good image of that person. Hope that helps you. Okay. Let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Caroline Bieber. Hi, Caroline. Hi, Alicia. I want to know if I speak in British English in America, will Americans understand me and vice versa? Uh, yes, they should. There should be no reason why an American English speaker should not understand a British English speaker or vice versa. It should not be a problem. Thanks very much for the question. Let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Alejandro. Hi, Alejandro. Alejandro says, hi, Alicia. I have a question. What's the meaning of the expression much obligated and how can I use this? I'm not sure about much obligated. That's not really an expression we use. We do have the expression much obliged, much obliged, um, which is like, thank you very much for helping me and I owe you for this. So if someone does something for you, you can say much obliged. It sounds rather formal and for some people, perhaps a little bit old fashioned actually. Um, you could use it at like the end of an email, for example. Thanks very much for the files, much obliged, that sort of thing. Like I owe you in return. So I hope that that helps you. Thanks very much for the question. Next question comes from Fabrizio Sanchez. Hi Fabrizio. Fabrizio says, can you explain the differences between should have, could have, would have, and their negative forms? Yes, but a proper answer is much bigger than just this Q&A video. So here's a quick short answer. Should have is used to talk about things we wish we had done in the past or we wish we had not done in the past. I should have studied more when I was a student. I shouldn't have had so much to drink last night. So we often have this kind of feeling of regret when we use should have or should not have. Could have refers to something that was possible in the past or impossible in the past. I could have finished work at six today if my boss hadn't given me a last minute task. Did you see that guy in the car? Was that Davey? Nah, that couldn't have been Davey. He's at work today. Could not means impossible. So could not have been Davy in that situation means it's impossible for that to have been Davy just now in the past. Uh, would have and would not have refers to a future action in the past. We are imagining ourselves as like in the past thinking about our future activities. I would have gone to the concert, but I had to work. I wouldn't have quit my job if I were you. So I'll try to make a whiteboard video about this in the future. Thanks very much for the question. Let's move on to your next question for this week. Next question comes from Sridhar Reddy. Hi, Sridhar. Sridhar says, hi, Alicia. How do I use the word wanting in a sentence and what does it mean? So we tend not to use mental state or emotional state verbs in anything other than the present tense or past tense. Uh, so want is an example of this. We tend not to use want in the progressive tense, but in a situation like I have been wanting, where we're talking about desiring something over a period of time that started in the past and continues to the present, we can use wanting. I've been wanting to see that movie for a long time or she's been wanting to take a vacation for a long time, or like, I've been wanting to eat that dessert for a long time. So I hope that that helps you. Okay, let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Izaldine. Hi, Izaldine. Uh, Izaldine says, what is the difference between where were you yesterday and 
where you have been yesterday. Uh, the difference is that the second sentence is incorrect. Uh, where were you yesterday means what was your location yesterday. The second sentence could be uh, where have you been or where have you been since yesterday. Uh, the first one is more common, where have you been. This question means uh, what was your location or what were your locations since the last time I saw you. So this is a question that commonly sounds like you're accusing someone. So if you expected to see someone and you did not see someone, like you've been waiting for a long time for someone, you can say, where have you been? Like, I was waiting for you, that kind of thing. We would use a question like, where were you yesterday? if we were expecting to see someone and they did not come as planned. Where were you yesterday? What happened? I was expecting to see you. Thanks very much for the question. Hope that helps. Let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Marcelo Oliveira. Hi again, Marcelo. Marcelo says, hi, Alicia. What is the difference between vain, vain, and vain? Yeah, um, a dictionary is helpful for questions like these. Uh, vain, V-A-N-E, uh, is a noun. That's part of a tool that's used to measure when wind or liquid, like the veins of a windmill, for example. Vain, V-A-I-N, is an adjective that means someone who is obsessed with themselves. Like, he's so vain, she's so vain, it's ridiculous. Vain, V-E-I-N, is a part of the body. It's also a noun. Uh, it's used to refer to the part of the body that carries blood. I hope that that helps you. Again, a dictionary is really helpful to understand the differences between words that sound and, and are spelled similar. All right, so that's everything that I have for this week. Thank you, as always, for sending your great questions. Remember to send them to me at englishclass101.com slash ask hyphen Alicia. Of course, if you like the video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to our channel if you have not already, and check us out at EnglishClass101.com for some other things that can help you with your English studies. Thanks very much for watching this week's episode of Ask Alicia, and I will see you again next time. Bye-bye. Hi everybody, welcome back to Ask Alicia, the weekly series where you ask me questions and I answer them. Maybe. First question this week comes from Isaac Alexander. Hi again, Isaac. Isaac says, hi Alicia, what's the difference between make or cook dinner and have or eat dinner. About make and cook dinner, there's really not a difference unless you want to be really, really specific and you're just like using a microwave or an oven to heat up food. In that case, it's probably more correct to say make dinner. Uh, regarding your second question about have or eat dinner or any other meal for that matter, um, they have the same meaning, yes, um, but we tend to use have more when we're making invitations, like do you want to have lunch or do you want to have dinner with me? We use it a bit more in those cases. Um, we use eat more when we're talking about like our personal plans. I think have just sounds a little bit softer for an invitation. So I hope that this helps you understand some of the small nuances there. Thanks very much for the question. Okay, let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Sungwan. Hi, Sungwan. Sungwan says, hi, can you describe what a stereotype means? Um, yeah, so a stereotype as a noun is kind of like an unfair or kind of a negative uh, idea about a person or a thing based on some common characteristics. So some examples of stereotypes are like, uh, women love shopping or men love sports, or like all Indian food is spicy, for example. So even though it's like something that might be true in many cases, um, it's not true in all cases. So this is a stereotype. I hope that that helps you. Okay, let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Ronnie Guntalidad. Hi, Ronnie. Ronnie says, how do you properly use the period and the comma in a sentences along with the proper grammar? Use periods at the end of a sentence. In the most basic form, a sentence is a subject and a verb. So like, I walked or he slept or she swam, for example. We put a period at the end of a sentence. I watched the new Batman movie. The neighbors ate all my popcorn. So those are more like complex sentences. We use commas then when we're connecting independent sentences with coordinating conjunctions. A coordinating conjunction is like and, but, or, for, so, yet. Uh, like I watched the new Batman movie and 
the neighbors ate all the popcorn. So I watched the new Batman movie, comma, and the neighbors ate all the popcorn. That's when I would use a comma, that's one example. Actually, there's a video on the channel I made about how to use commas. It's an introduction to using commas, so I recommend you check this video out to learn more about commas. So I hope that that helps you. Thanks very much for the question. Okay, let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Karima. Hi again, Karima. Karima says, I think the verb address has different meanings. Could you tell me some of them? One of the meanings of address is to write the mail address on like a letter or a package like please address your envelope to or I have a package addressed to so-and-so uh, address also means to deal with something or to handle an issue usually a problem something negative how do you plan to address this situation or when are you going to address this issue for example so that means deal with or handle something Another meaning of address is like to give a formal speech or to talk directly to someone. So like the president addressed the country in a televised speech or the CEO plans to address the employees in the morning meeting. So there are three different examples of how to use address. Again, if you want to know more about definitions, I highly recommend checking a dictionary. Okay, hope that helped you. Let's go on to your next question. Next question comes from Marcelo Oliveira. Hi, Marcelo. Marcelo says, uh, hi, Alicia. What do these expressions mean? Uh, to scrape the bottom of the barrel and last resort. Resort. Um, to scrape the bottom of the barrel means to use like only the people or the things that you have available and this means that they're typically not of good quality. Some examples. I had to scrape the bottom of the barrel to find this computer for work. You put that guy on your team? You're scraping the bottom of the barrel. Um, your second question about the word last resort means like your last option, the last thing that you are able to do or the last thing you can possibly do. You have no other options in a situation. You turn to your last resort. I might not have enough money to launch my business. My last resort is asking my parents for a loan. If this job doesn't work out, his last resort is to start working at his friend's company. So I hope that that helps you understand those two expressions. Thanks very much for the questions. All right, that's everything that I have for this week. Thank you, as always, for sending your questions. Remember, you can send them to me at englishclass101.com slash ask hyphen Alicia. Of course, if you like the video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to our channel if you have not already, and check us out at englishclass101.com for some other things that can help you with your English studies. Thanks very much for watching this week's episode of Ask Alicia, and I'll see you again soon. Bye. Be funny. <laughs> be funny. Quick, Alicia, be funny. Oh, God. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Ask Alicia, the weekly series where you ask me questions and I answer them. Maybe. First question comes from Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Sarah says, what's the difference between just and adjust? Just can be used to refer to an action that was very recently completed. I just finished my workout. We just ate dinner. We just turned the cameras on. And we use it to talk about actions that are going to finish in the near future, usually with about, like I was just about to do something. I was just about to go on to the next question, or I was just about to go home when it started raining. So these are a couple of very common uses of just. Adjust, however, is a verb. To adjust means to make a change to something, usually like a small change to something, like to fix something or to make it match something else. Some examples, he made me adjust my hair before I started talking, or I need to adjust my jacket before I go on stage. We just adjusted the cameras. Oh, I hope that that helps you. Let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Atsushi. Mizuno. Hi, Atsushi. Atsushi says, I have two questions. Okay, first one, what is the difference between the something something and this something something? Second, how do I use it seems that and seems to? Uh, okay, first one, the. Uh, so the something something versus this something something, it's kind of a big question. The is used to refer to something that you mentioned earlier in the conversation. So here are some examples. I saw a dog. I pet the dog. Thank you for sending me the paperwork I requested. 
So in each of these cases, the person listening or the person reading the message understands what the is. So there's some like previous like conversation or there's some previous information. So we know that the refers to a specific instance of that. So we use this when we want to differentiate between two nouns. So we use this before the noun. I don't want that sandwich. I want this sandwich. So I'm differentiating between these two. I think this coffee shop has great lattes. So when I use this here, it's like the other coffee shops I know maybe don't have such great lattes. I want to emphasize this one. We use it a lot in questions like, is this drink yours? So meaning from all these other drinks here, is this one in particular, the specific drink, is this yours? So your second question was about the difference between seems that and seems to. Uh, the difference here is just seems that is followed by a noun and seems to is followed by a verb. For example, uh, it seems that you made a mistake or it seems that he is out of time. Sugar. Sugar? A grandma. Sorry, yeah. yeah, grandma. It seems that you are out of sugar. <laughs> So like evil sounding, like it seems you're out of sugar, grandma. It seems that I have enough examples for this, so I'll move on to the next one. Seems to then is followed by a verb, like this seems to uh, have been a mistake. He seems to like spicy food. She seems to have a lot of hobbies. So we follow seems to with a verb. Thanks very much for the question. Let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Aya. Hi, Aya. Aya says, what's the difference between gorgeous, adorable, fabulous, and beautiful? Um, Beautiful is like the most general word from this group. We can use beautiful to talk about people, to talk about nature, to talk about music. Adorable is like, is cute. We use adorable to talk about things that are cute, meaning kind of childish. That can be a person, like so like a little kid is adorable. That's usually the tone of voice we use when we say it too. Oh, he's adorable, she's adorable. We also use it for like design, um, things that have like this kind of cute or childlike appearance as well. Like, oh, that's adorable. This room is adorable. I love this design, that's adorable. So gorgeous then, you can think of gorgeous as like a leveled up beautiful. We use gorgeous, when we talk about people, we use gorgeous to talk about adults and we use it to have like this kind of feeling of glamorous or maybe it's kind of expensive or it seems high quality. Something is gorgeous, like wow, that chandelier is gorgeous or her dress is gorgeous or wow, he's gorgeous, that model, for example. So we can also use it for nature, like oh my gosh, the sunset was gorgeous or like that cake I ate for breakfast was gorgeous. I did not eat a cake for breakfast. Finally, fabulous is kind of a playful word. It means great in general. Something that's great can be like fabulous. And you might hear people say it with kind of a funny intonation, like that's fabulous. So kind of this uh, silly, joking, playful intonation. Like, oh my gosh, your shirt is fabulous. This dinner was fabulous. Or, oh my God, your new hairstyle is fabulous. So just kind of pay attention to the kinds of people who use the word fabulous that you see in the media. And maybe you can kind of get the idea uh, of how and when you might use it. All right, so I hope that that helps you. Thanks very much for the question. Let's go on to your next question. Next question comes from Vishnu. Hi, Vishnu. Vishnu says, how to use these forms, have been, has been, and had been correctly. Okay, these questions refer to the present perfect tense. Uh, have been and has been are present perfect tense uh, grammar structures. So please check this video on the channel. Uh, I did a video about how to make and how to use the present perfect tense. Um, there's also some information about present perfect progressive tense. Uh, regarding your question about had been, uh, when we use had been, that's past perfect tense. Um, so we use that to talk about an action that was continuing in the past before another action in the past. So for example, I had been studying for three hours when the phone rang, or she had been sleeping for 
six hours when it started raining. Something that was like a continuing action that was in the past, often that was interrupted. So I'll try to make a whiteboard video about past perfect tense. I hope that that helps you. Thanks very much for the question. Okay, let's go to your next question. Next question comes from Arseny. Hi, Arseny. Arseny says, hi, Alicia. What's the difference between site, place, and area? Site is used in like construction projects. We use site to talk about the place where a new building is going to be made. Wear a hard hat on the construction site. Let's visit the site and make the plans. Place is quite a general word, um, but it refers to like a specific location. Let's go to my place, or this is a really nice place, or I know a good place up the street. Finally, area is like a larger region uh, than place. Let's hang out in the downtown area later. There were typhoon warnings in the coastal areas today. So I hope that that helps you. Uh, thanks very much for the question. Let's move on to our next question. Next question comes from Connie. Hi, Connie. Connie says, what's the difference between others the others and another. How do I use in the correct situation? Yeah, this is tough. Okay, let's begin by introducing a sample situation. Look at this picture. This is my sister. This is my other sister. The others are my parents. Now let's look at another picture. So here I introduced other with my other sister. In the second sentence here, I said, this is my sister. Third sentence was, this is my other sister. So I introduced sister in the first sentence. Other then refers to like the addition to something that's already known. So it's kind of like there's a very close relationship between those two sentences. This is my sister, this is my other sister. Shows that there's like an addition to the thing I just said. Then when I say the other, the other refers to like the remaining known things. So if I'm looking at this picture and I know that there are four people in the picture and two people are the speaker's sisters, there are two people remaining and I say the other people, that means the remaining people in the picture that I don't yet know. So the other people in the picture are my parents. Then I say, let's look at another picture. So another refers to an addition or something extra from outside the existing situation. So I hope that this can help you see the relationships between other, the other, and another. Okay, that's everything that I have for this week. Thank you, as always, for sending your questions. Remember, please send your questions to me at englishclass101.com slash ask hyphen Alicia. Of course, if you like the video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel if you have not already, and check us out at englishclass101.com for some other things that can help you with your English studies. Thanks very much for watching this week's episode of Ask Alicia, and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye. Hi everybody, welcome back to Ask Alicia, the weekly series where you ask me questions and I answer them. Maybe. First question comes from Isaac Alexander again. Hi Isaac. What's the difference between switch on and off and turn on and off? Which is more casual? Less so than casual, in American English, turn on and turn off is more common. Switch on or switch off is just less common. That's all. Hope that helps you. Thanks for the question. Okay, let's go to your next question. Next question comes from Zakari. Hi, Zakari. Zakari says, I hear Americans pronounce the article A before a word in a sentence with the sound A and sometimes pronounced with the sound A. Uh. Is there a rule about that? No, <laughs> there's no rule. There is absolutely not a rule for this. It's just speaker preference. Though I do feel personally, when I'm trying to emphasize something, I'll use A more. It's up to personal preference. It's all just a speaker's preference. So I hope that that helps you, no rule. Thanks for the question. Okay, let's go to the next question. Next question comes from Harris. Hi, Harris. Harris says, hi, Alicia. What is the difference between using yet and instead of and despite. Let's begin by comparing yet and despite. We'll talk about instead of at the end. Let's begin by comparing two sentences. I wanted to go to the party, yet I stayed home. I wanted to go to the party. Despite that, I stayed home. 
Let's look at the first example sentence here, which uses yet. So yet is a conjunction here. It's connecting these two ideas. I wanted to go to the party and I stayed home. Yet gives us the meaning of even though or but. So we see it's kind of like saying A, which is the desire, I wanted to go to the party, A, and B, the outcome, the actual result, I stayed at home, are connected with this yet statement. So A, yet, B. Desire, yet, outcome. Let's compare this to despite. So a key difference between despite and yet is that we cannot use despite as a conjunction. We need to include despite with that initial desire, that A point that I talked about in the yet explanation. So it's like saying despite A, B. So it has the same meaning, yes, but it just has a different structure. The sentence has a different structure. When you make a sentence like this, you can introduce A, the desire, then connect it to the next sentence, not using a comma, but with the next sentence, you can say, despite this or despite that, where that means part A. So I wanted to go to the party, A. Despite that, despite wanting to go to the party, B, I stayed at home. So you need to connect your despite with something like this or that, or the specific noun phrase. You might also hear the very common expressions, despite the fact that, or despite wanting to, blah, 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 we need to use some kind of noun phrase to introduce that point. So this is a key difference between yet and despite. Finally, let's take a look at instead of. Instead of refers to a substitution, so you're doing something in place of something else. I stayed home instead of going to the party. So this means, in place of going to the party, I stayed at home. So despite and yet have very similar uses, but we need to make slightly different grammatical structures in order to use them. Instead of just refers to something that is being substituted for something else. So I hope that that helps. Thanks very much for the question. All right, let's go on to the next question. Next question comes from Karima. Hi Karima, hi again. Uh, Karima says, hi Alicia, I want you to explain the phrase get started grammatically if it's possible. When do we use get plus adjective or get plus a verb. Yeah, okay. So we can use get plus a verb when we're talking about uh, beginning the process of that verb. So when I start videos on this channel with the expression, let's get started, I'm saying, let's begin the first steps of starting. Some examples, I gotta get going. That means I need to begin to leave. Let's get cooking. That means let's start the process of cooking something. You should get writing. So we can't pair all verbs with this get plus verb pattern, uh, but there are quite a few that we can use. To move on to your next question though, get plus adjective, get just means become here, but become sounds very formal. So we use get instead. Some examples. I'm gonna get pretty for my date tonight. The fight got ugly. It's getting dark outside. Don't get drunk. So I hope that this helps answer your question. Thanks very much. Let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Milan. Hi, Milan. Milan says, hi, Alicia. I would like to ask, is there any difference between my and mine? For example, he is my friend and he is friend of mine. Okay, um, your example sentences have the same meaning, just one small correction, he is a friend of mine. He is a friend of mine. Don't forget that article that you need with your singular noun. I would say though that the my pattern is more commonly used than the mine pattern. I think that this comes from the fact that when we end a sentence with mine, it kind of sounds like we're being greedy or possessive. In your example, like he's a friend of mine, that's very, very common. That's kind of a set phrase that we use a lot. But in other examples, I would just go with the simple my pattern. This something is my something, or this is my blah, blah, blah. Um, I just feel that that sounds a little bit less like greedy, like mine. You sometimes hear kids or like um, even adults sometimes when they get really excited about owning something or having something, they might say like, this is mine. So it can have kind of a negative feel about it. For that reason, I would recommend the my pattern instead of the mine pattern. 
So I hope that that helps you. All right, so thank you very much as always for sending your questions. Remember, you can send them to me at englishclass101.com slash ask hyphen Alicia. Of course, if you liked the video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel if you have not already, and check us out at englishclass101.com for some other things that can help you with your English studies. Thanks very much for watching this week's episode of Ask Alicia, and I will see you again next time. Bye bye. Yay! Yay! Yay. <laughs> some examples. Are gone. Where'd they go? Okay. Um, I gotta get what? Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Ask Alicia, the weekly series where you ask me questions and I answer them. Maybe. First question comes from Muki. Hi, Muki. Muki says, I want to know about test taking tips. Okay. Uh, I will give you five tips. Tip number one is to know your test. On your test, do you need to write? Do you need to read, listen, speak? What do you need to do? First, make sure you know the test and know the requirements of the test. Number two, check and see if the sections are timed. Check to see how much time you have for each section of your test. Number three is to ask yourself, have you taken the test before? What was good for you? What was not good for you? So what do you need to improve? Review your past tests to see what you need to work on for the next test. Number four, if you can, if it's available, take a practice test. Practice tests can help you find your weak points and your strong points and help you if you have timed sections in your test as well. Number five, if your test includes speaking, you need to practice speaking. If you don't practice, you won't be able to do it at the time that you need it. So if you don't have a language partner, you can look for one online or you can practice with media, like repeating, shadowing media. So those are five quick test tips. I know they're very general, uh, but I hope that they can apply to lots of different tests. So I hope that this helps you. Thanks for the question. Okay, let's go on to your next question. Next question comes from Nerdon Eminet. Hi again, Nerdon. Nerdon says, hi Alicia, what's the difference between blame, accuse, and charge? All right, blame, accuse, and charge. These are three verbs that have very similar meanings. Let's begin with blame. To blame means to assign someone responsibility for something. This has a negative nuance to it. Some examples. My parents blamed me for the broken vase. The police blamed the accident on a broken traffic light. To accuse someone means to suggest that someone did something bad. So it's a little bit different from blame. Blame is like assigning responsibility to someone for like a negative effect. To accuse someone of something is like someone did something wrong, maybe on purpose, and you want to suggest that it was that person. Some examples. The landlord accused him of not paying rent. She accused the company of fraud. Let's move along then to the last one, to charge. To charge is a legal term. This is a legal word, which means you formally accuse someone of wrongdoing. So we do not use charge in everyday conversation when we're saying like, you did this bad thing, or I think it was you. Charge is used in courts. To charge someone with a crime means to officially and legally accuse them of a crime. Examples. The suspect has been charged with murder. She's been charged with breaking and entering. So that's a quick introduction to the differences between these three verbs. I hope that that helped you. Thanks for an interesting question. Okay, let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Isaac Alexander. Hi again, Isaac. Isaac says, hi Alicia, what's the difference between soccer and football? <laughs> yeah, um, soccer is just the word that people from the US use to talk about what the rest of the world calls football. So to my knowledge, most if not all other countries use the word football to talk about the game with the black and white ball that players kick around a field. Uh, we do have a football of our own. We have what many people call American football, which is a totally different game, which involves passing and a little bit of kicking. If you're speaking with an American English speaker, soccer refers to the black and white ball sport. Football refers to that kind of egg-shaped brown leather ball sport. If you're talking to maybe a British English speaker, uh, football probably means what American English speakers call soccer. I hope that that helps you. Thanks for the question. All right, let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Ahmed Magdi. Hi, Ahmed. Uh, Ahmed says, hi, Alicia, what does whiplash mean? 
Uh, whiplash, this is an injury. Whiplash is an injury that happens when the body is like jerked in a strong way, like in a car accident or maybe another like transportation related accident. Whiplash is an injury around like the head and neck and shoulders where the body and the head move like separately. If this is the body and this is the head, they move separately like in a very quick, like jumping, like whip like motion. If you know a whip, it's like this. Indiana Jones has one. It's like, uh, so to like whiplash is the name of the injury we get from our bodies being moved in this way. So I hope that that helps you. Thanks very much for the question. Okay, let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Karima. Hi again, Karima. Karima says, hi Alicia. I wanna ask you, what does the preposition up mean or refer to in the following sentence? What exactly are you up to? Uh, all right, this up doesn't have any meaning. So what are you up to or what's up? This is just a set phrase. Up doesn't have any like directional meaning. There's no movement or positioning. Just consider this a set phrase like what's up uh, means how are you or what are you doing? Same thing with what exactly are you up to? It means what exactly are you doing? Up doesn't really have a function here. It's just a set phrase. So don't worry too much about what exactly up means here. It's sort of just, it's just an expression that we use. So that's everything that I have for this week. Thank you as always for sending your questions. Remember, you can send them to me at englishclass101.com slash ask hyphen Alicia. Of course, if you like the video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel if you have not already, and check us out at englishclass101.com for some other things that can help you with your English studies. Thanks very much for watching this episode of Ask Alicia, and I will see you again next week. Bye-bye. Hi everybody, welcome back to Ask Alicia, the weekly series where you ask me questions and I answer them. Maybe. First question comes from Leon. Hi Leon. Leon says, hi Alicia. Number one, I'd like to know why we have to place incarnate and galore after nouns. And two, how do you pronounce the S after a TH or ST sound like months and scientists would be glad if you answer. Okay. All right. So regarding your first question, these are examples of what are called post positive adjectives. So these are adjectives that come after a noun. In English, we usually use pre positive adjectives. So those are adjectives that come before a noun. However, for a number of reasons, there are some adjectives that we place after the noun. So your examples, incarnate and galore, usually come after a noun. So for example, you might know the devil incarnate, or there was food galore at the event, for example. These are just situations that are kind of set phrases, honestly. Unfortunately, there's not really a rule. It's just one of those things that you need to remember. So regarding your second question about the S sound, in a word like months, your tongue touches the back of your teeth and we make like a quick S sound, months, months. So the TH sound almost disappears. It's sort of like when you're saying the or this or that, that really quick TH sound. In a word like scientists, however, scientists is very difficult to say in rapid speech. So we make it like a long S sound, scientists. So it just sounds like scientists. Thanks for the question. Let's go on to your next question. The next question comes from Karima. Hi, Karima. Karima says, hi, Alicia. I want to know the difference between right now and right away, and when can we use both of them? Okay, right now sounds more direct than right away. Right now is like a command, actually. So this is something that you might hear parents use like for kids. So like go to your room right now is a really good example of how right now is used. Right away, however, is used in more formal situations like in business situations or work situations to show that something will be done immediately immediately, but it sounds a bit soft. Some examples. Can you please order lunch for our meeting? Yes, right away. Please take care of this right away. So I hope that this helps you understand when to use these two. Thanks very much for the question. Okay, let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Liliana Inez Jose Concepcion. Sorry, hi Liliana. What is the difference between mistake and error? Nice question. Mistake tends to be used more for human actions, things that we did or things that we caused, humans, us people, our activities. Some examples. I made a mistake with this recipe. She found a mistake in the textbook. 
error is used for machines, like computers. So if there's a problem with the like machine that you're using or like your printer or something, you'll see an error message, not a mistake message. Examples, printer error, error downloading file. There are some cases where we might use error to talk about the things that humans do, uh, but for kind of a general guide, this is basically the difference. I hope that that helps you. Thanks for the question. Okay, let's move on to your next question. Next question is from Silas. Hi, Silas. Silas says, hi, Alicia. What does straight up mean and how can I use it in a sentence? Yeah, uh, straight up means like honest, true, genuine, real. It's kind of got a positive feeling about it. It tends to be used a little bit more by young people. I would say more by young men, but anyone can use it. Some examples. I straight up forgot my wallet. He straight up passed out in the car on the way home. You have to be straight up with your roommate. So you can see that straight up does have a casual feel. It also kind of has a friendly feel, though it is talking about like an honest or a true or a real situation or an attitude. So I hope that this helps you understand the use of straight up. Thanks very much for the question. Okay, let's move along to your next question. Next question comes from Ahmad Sarwar. Hi, Ahmad. Ahmad says, hi, Alicia. What is the difference between lay, lie, lying, and laying? How do you use and pronounce these words in your daily life? Yeah, I talked about this question in episode 21 of this series. You can check that out and find some more example sentences there. So to review, lay uses a direct object. Lie does not. Examples, lay down your bag here. Lie down on the sofa. So in the first example sentence, your bag is the direct object of the verb lay. Lay down your bag here. In the second example sentence, lie down on the sofa. There's no direct object in that sentence. So as I said in the previous episode, what makes this difficult is that the past tense of the verb lie is lay. He lay down on the sofa. We lay down and went to sleep. In the first example sentence, he lay down on the sofa, there's no direct object. We don't see a direct object in the second sentence either. So we know that this lay is actually the past tense of lie and not the present tense lay. Keep in mind, however, the past tense of lay is laid. Examples. We laid our bags on the table. She laid her keys on her desk. Each of these example sentences has a direct object, so a bag and keys. So if you want to know, is this lay or is this lie, look for a direct object. That'll tell you which verb you're dealing with. So your question is about the progressive forms of these verbs, laying and lying. So an example in the progressive tense, our cat keeps laying dead animals on our front door. He's lying on the sofa. That's the progressive form of lie, so there's no direct object there. I hope that that helps you. Okay, so that's everything that I have for this week. Thank you, as always, for sending your questions. Remember to send them to me at englishclass101.com slash ask hyphen Alicia. Of course, if you like the video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to our channel if you have not already, and check us out at englishclass101.com for some other things that can help you with your English studies. Thanks very much for watching this episode of Ask Alicia, and I will see you again next week. Bye-bye. Want to speed up your language learning? Take your very first lesson with us. You'll start speaking in minutes and master real conversations. Sign up for your free lifetime account. Just click the link in the description.